as I mentioned previously, industrialization depends on a stable foundation of agriculture to provide enough food to increase the population and to provide enough for workers to eat. As farming becomes more efficient, not everyone needs to focus on subsistence and workers are then available to move to cities and take jobs in factories. The remaining farms become bigger and take on the responsibility of feeding the growing urban populations. Earlier agricultural societies in Europe had depended on crop rotation to rebuild soils after periods of intensive planting. But as farmers saw the opportunity to earn money in the market feeding these urban industrial workers, some were unwilling to accept the idea that a large percentage of their farm would have to be fallow every year. They preferred to amend their soils rather than just wait for the fertility to regenerate naturally. But few farmers had access to enough manure to supplement all their soil. Luckily, at about this time, an alternative came along. The first commercial fertilizers were made from guano, the droppings of the seabirds living off the droppings of the seabirds living on the islands off the western shores of South America. Guano comes from the Quechua Indian word guanu, which means any excrement that's used as a soil additive. Guano was dry and light and highly concentrated. Natives of the Andes, you may recall, had mined guano on the coast and the islands for at least 1,500 years, and Spanish colonial records noted that the Inca rulers had considered protecting the cormorants that were the main source of guano to be so important that disturbing the birds' nesting areas was a capital offense. Guano was carried up from the coast into the Andes on the backs of llamas for use on the terraced farms surrounding highland cities like Machu Picchu. Although they're surrounded by ocean, the islands off the western coast of South America are arid. Like the deserts that they face on the mainland, some get absolutely no rainfall at all. Seabirds like cormorants and pelicans have lived on these islands by the millions for thousands of years. Over time, they have left literally mountains of droppings, which due to the lack of rain have simply piled up. The guano actually contains ideal percentages of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium that make it an excellent fertilizer without any mixing. It simply needs to be chopped off the mountain, ground up, and spread on fields. The Prussian explorer Alexander von Humboldt visited the islands around 1802, and when he returned to Europe, he began publicizing guano's value as a fertilizer. Seeing a lucrative business opportunity, Europeans and Americans rushed to this area in what really became a guano rush. And by the middle of the century, several nations had enlisted the work of Chinese peasants in a Pacific labor system that has been compared with the slavery of the Atlantic world. Because although the Chinese were technically free, many were debtors who had been tricked into labor contracts, promising them work in California. Once they reached the Guano Islands off the coast of Peru and realized they had been duped, there was no way off. Over 100,000 Chinese workers were imported to the islands in the second half of the 19th century. Guano was so profitable that the United States Congress passed a Guano Islands Act in 1856. The law provided an incentive for American sailors to find and claim undefended islands for America by giving the discoverer exclusive rights to the guano that was recovered. Islands claimed under this Guano Islands Act include parts of the Hawaiian chain, Midway, and part of American Samoa, as well as several islands closer to South America that are still disputed with Colombia. The Guano Islands off the western coast of South America were so valuable that two wars were fought over them. Chile and Peru fought Spain in the Chincha Islands War from 1864 to 1866, and they defeated the Spanish Empire. Then, once Spain's claim had successfully been set aside, Chile took many of the Guano Islands from Peru, along with the nitrate fields of the Atacama Desert in the War of the Pacific from 1879 to 1883. After about 1870, guano was overtaken as a source of nitrogen fertilizer by these nitrate-rich desert soils called caliche in the Atacama Desert. They were discovered there in a region that is still regarded as the driest place on Earth that lay partly in Chile, partly in Peru, and partly in Bolivia. When all of these three nations rushed 
to start extracting and processing caliche, Chile challenged its northern rivals for the nitrate fields. Chile's victory in the War of the Pacific extended its border northwards to encompass the entire Atacama Desert, including all of the coastal territory that had belonged to Bolivia. Many ethnic Bolivians living around the port city of Arica still dream of throwing out the Chileans and winning their country access to the Pacific again. Defeating its northern neighbors in the War of the Pacific made Chile the undisputed power on the west coast of the Americas and generated an economic boom. The nitrate that Chile monopolized was valuable both as fertilizer and as a key ingredient in explosives and munitions. But mining and processing nitrate from Chile's desert soils required much more capital than just digging guano. Chile attracted British investors, and soon joint ventures began shipping a million tons of nitrate per year out of the South American desert. Production grew steadily until 1914, when World War I created new incentives for Britain's enemies to find an alternative to caliche nitrate. And we'll talk about this invention and the shift to an economic form of imperialism by European nations and Britain and even the United States in the next chapter. So a question to discuss. Why did fertilizer become important enough to fight wars over?